Now that we know how to calculate rate from experimental data, it's time for us to move on to the next part of learning about chemical kinetics, which is writing what we call the rate law of a reaction. So a rate law is just an equation that shows how we can calculate the rate of a given reaction. Now, in order for us to write this equation, we need to know what factors determine the rate of a reaction. From experience, you might already know some of these factors. So, for example, one of the most common factors, of course, is temperature. We know that when we increase the temperature of something, the process tends to go faster. That's why you cook at high temperature. And notice that when you want to slow things down, you put it at a lower temperature. You put things in the refrigerator, for example, to slow some of the decay process of fruits, vegetables, and other food items. Another thing that we know will increase the reaction rate is concentration. And then lastly, we have something we call catalyst, which is a third substance, not necessarily a reactant or a product, but it causes the reaction to go faster. So it itself is not consumed. It gets regenerated at the end of the reaction. So another way to say this is that the equation that represents rate should be a function of concentration, catalyst, and temperature. So all these three factors should be present in any equation that represents rate of a reaction. Before we actually learn how to write these rate laws, you should know that there are two types of these rate laws or rate equations. There's something we call the differential rate law, and there's something we call the integrated rate law. Those of you who have taken calculus, you would recognize these represents two types of equation, and that's exactly what the rate laws are. They're just two types of equations. They're related by the process in calculus we call differentiation or integration. You don't need to know any calculus, though, in order to be able to understand how to use the equations. Now, the main thing you need to know here is that the differential rate law tells you rate as a function of concentration of reactant. So the equation would look something like rate is F of concentration of reactant, whereas the integrated rate law is relating concentration of reactant as a function of time. We'll see it written in more expanded form later on, but this is just an idea to keep in mind that each of these rate law has its own form. So we're going to start with the differential rate law, which Typically, it's just called the rate law. So when we say determine the rate law, what we mean is just determine the differential rate law. So if the question wants you to determine the integrated rate law, it will specifically say that. So we're going to start with our favorite reaction here, which is AABBCCDD, where the uppercase letters represent the actual species, and then the lowercase letters represent the coefficients. Whenever you're given a reaction that looks like this, if you want to write the differential rate law, all you have to do is write it in this form right here, which is rate is equal to K times the concentration of the first reactant, A, raised to some power. We put the letter M there to denote that power. We'll discuss what this means in a sec. And then the second reactant, which is B, concentration of that raised to the power of N. Okay, before we go further, this is an equation where rate is a function of concentration. That's what a differential rate will represent tells you how the rate of the reaction is affected by the concentration of the reactant that is present. So what is this Km and N? K is called the rate constant. Turns out that for every reaction, there is a number that affect how that reaction rate progresses, and this is called the rate constant. Now the term constant here is a little confusing for students because even though it's a constant, it's not a universal constant, so it doesn't mean that there's one number for all reactions. The rate constant actually depends on the reaction itself. So if I have one reaction, it's going to have a different rate constant from another reaction. It turns out later you'll find out that the rate constant also depends on temperature of the reaction and it depends on whether catalyst is present or not in the reaction. So it's not a number that is a constant like speed of light is a constant, but changes depending on the reaction. The larger the value of K is, the faster the reaction. You can probably see that from the equation itself. K is directly related to rate, so if this number goes bigger, 
then the rate will also go bigger. Now, what about those other two numbers there, M and N? Those are exponents that we put on the reactant. Why do we put them there? It turns out that when we talk about the mechanism of reactions, you'll find out that the way these reactants combine together to form products depends on specific types of steps. Some of those steps require maybe two of the reactant particles to come together. Some of them require maybe one to rearrange itself. Some of them might require three of them to come together. So all of these specific steps that the reactant take to convert themselves to product is what these numbers represent. Now, we're going to get details of that later on. But right now, what you need to know is that first off, those exponents are called the order of each reactant. And then they are generally small positive whole numbers, at least for most of the reactions we're going to be dealing with in this class that's what you're going to see. So typically they're either one or two. Sometimes they could also be zero. So zero, one, or two are sort of the common one. In rare cases, they could be negative or fractional. Although I would say in this class, you're probably not gonna see that too often. Maybe just one example, but the majority is gonna be zero, one, or two. Each reactant has its own order. So in this case, M represents the order with respect to reactant A. And we're gonna have to figure out what that order is from experimental data. And then N represents the order with respect to reactant B. And then we have this term called the overall order of the reaction. It's a sum of M and N together. In reactions where you have three reactants, you're going to add all the orders. So maybe M, N, N, O. Okay, so there's three different orders. When a question asks you to determine the form of the rate law, what they are asking you to do is to determine the order of the reaction. They want to figure out what is the value of each of these order. Now, here's the part that's super important because these orders are not the reactant's coefficient. So the order and the coefficient are two separate things. They might happen to have the same value. So for example, let's say the coefficient one and then for one of the reactants and then the order is also one. That's just by coincidence. So you will see later on that there is a special type of reaction where the order and the coefficient are exactly the same number, but that's not the case in a general reaction. So another key information is to understand that both the K value, the rate constant, and the order have to be determined through experiments. So in other words, you have to collect data, just like what we talked about in a prior lecture. You get those concentration versus time data, and then from that data to get your K and your order. Okay, so here's an example of just writing rate law. Okay, so we're not talking about actually calculating the order yet or calculating the rate constant. We're going to do that in a sec. But right now, it's just asking you, if I give you a reaction and then I give you the order of that reaction, can you write the rate law? So here's the reaction. NO2 plus CO goes to NO plus CO2. It tells you that it's second order in NO2 and first order in CO. What is the rate law? So... This just means write the rate law for me, okay? So the rate law is always written in this form. Rate equals K times reactant, concentration raised to some order, and then second reactant, some order, okay? So that's what I start with. I write it as rate equals K times concentration of NO2, because that's my first reactant, raised to some order. It's the second order, so I'm going to say second power right there. And then first order in CO, something to the power of 1 is just itself. So I don't need to put that power of one. I'll just leave it blank like that. That is understood. So that would be my rate law for this reaction. And again, we haven't said how we got the order. We'll do that later, but that's how you would write the rate law. Here's a second question. It says you have a reaction called a transesterification reaction. But the key here is this equation, which is the reaction equation. So you have two reactants there. One reactant is methanol which is CH3OH, and the other reactant is something called ethyl acetate, which is a type of molecule called ester, something you'll learn more in organic chemistry. What we were told is that the rate law for the reaction is here, K times CH3OH. What they're asking us is, what's the order of the reaction with respect to each of the reactants? So to solve this problem, again, I start with the same general form of the rate law, which is rate equals K times concentration of the first reactant raised to some power, and then concentration of the second reactant raised to some power. We were told that the actual rate law looks like this. It's rate equals to K times CH3OH concentration. 
So then how does that information help us answer the order? Well, we can see that this part is the same. And then from here, we can see that that must mean that our M is equal to one, right? Because we have CHCOH on its own. So remember that anything power of one is the same as itself. But then we don't see this part how did it disappear from the equation? So what you have to think about is what exponent makes it so that that whole term doesn't exist anymore. When I say doesn't exist, what do I mean? That means that when multiply with the rest of them, that thing doesn't change the equation. So in other words, the value of this whole thing that I circle here is equal to one. So another way to ask the question then is, what is the value of the exponent so that this whole expression becomes equal to one? N has to be zero. So in other words, it's a zeroth order reactant. Something raised to the power of zero is equal to one. Once we understand that, then we know that the order with respect to the first reactant, methanol, is equal to one. The order with respect to the second reactant, ethyl acetate, is equal to zero. Notice that the overall order of this reaction is one because you have zero plus one, and that's the answer to the other part of the question.